بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good morning everybody and I am very happy to be a speaker in this prestigious meeting the 8th Arab Society of Pediatric Penetration Congress held in Cairo uh, and unfortunately for you know work issues I could not leave the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to attend physically which I wished to be now with you in Cairo however I will be you know discussing uh, two cases which are of interest in the field of cow milk protein allergy and we'll go through them. Uh, uh, I have also uh, prepared some polls. However, we can discuss you know, these uh, questions together. So to start with, I have nothing to disclose. And actually I just you know, uh, came yesterday from the family farm where the weather is uh, very interesting and this is an open invitation for anybody who comes to Riyadh to visit our farm, which is more than 1,000 farm dates. In any nutrition you know, meetings, we should always stress in the role of breastfeeding for the sake of our infants in health and disease. And unfortunately, in this study dating back to 2012, you know, school teachers were you know, questionnaired and only 8.3% of them, they have continued exclusive breastfeeding for six months, which is you know, a very low rate of breastfeeding in our society for many uh, reasons, especially for women who are at work and we need to work hard also to improve this figure. Cow milk is for cows and you know different animal milks for the same species like elephants, horses, giraffe, etc. And human milk is for human. So this is one of my messages during this presentation. I will go with the first case. This is a two-month-old baby presented with persistent vomiting and lethargy for two days. He has no fever and no diarrhea. And he was a product of normal pregnancy, full-term vaginal delivery. He was started on standard infant formula and he was feeding very well. His mother has allergic rhinitis. On physical examination, he was stable. However, he was uh, you know, having stable vital signs he was a little bit lethargic and he was found to have mild to moderate dehydration, no skin rashes and the rest of the examination is normal. So the first question now, what is your next step? Would you do a full septic workup and start broad spectrum antibiotics or do a metabolic screen or correct dehydration or abdominal ultrasound or all? So, you know, when you think of these, you know, uh, possibilities, uh, most uh, likely this patient will need to correct dehydration to start with. So any child who is dehydrated, we need to correct dehydration. And any, you know, infant at two months of age who is lethargic, we need to rule out sepsis. So we need to do a full septic workup and start broad spectrum antibiotics because sepsis can present with just lethargy and dehydration. However, because metabolic diseases are common in our society, you know, they could present with lethargy, vomiting, and you know, we need to screen for them. So we need to send metabolic screen. However, abdominal ultrasound, it is controversial. Only in an infant at two months of age, because of vomiting, you need to roll out pyloric stenosis, uh, you know, uh, by using uh, abdominal ultrasound. However, you know, there are other reasons why babies may be lethargic and they need, you know, to have abdominal ultrasound rather than pyloric stenosis. So uh, going back to 1986, you know, lethargy was, you know, described as a presenting symptom in patients with intersusception. 
So, so this could be a presentation of intersusception. And we need to consider this in our differential diagnosis because intersusception will cause ischemia to the bowel. Then some toxic metabolites will go to the brain and cross the brain, blood brain barrier and cause lethargy. So you should this put, put this in mind in every child who has you know, lethargy, vomiting, dehydration, and he has no other explanation of his symptoms. This is, you know, the ultrasound in case of intersusception where you see the typical target legions or, you know, doing barium enema will, you know, give you the right diagnosis and it will be also diagnostic and lethargic. However, going back to our patient, we did a septic screen and we started antibiotics and we sent metabolic screen and we did ultrasound, which was normal. And we kept the patient MPO because he was vomiting and he has some lethargy. Some labs in the first day of admission showed the you know, complete blood count showed the WBC of 12.3 and with neutrophilia merely, 82%. And platelet count was a little bit high of 654. However, the CRB is normal, is only 0.8 milligram per liter. So, Patient was started in antibiotics, was kept in PO. We did, you know, the metabolic screen. We did the, you know, uh, abdominal ultrasound, which is normal. Symptom improved. Baby is more active. However, cultures on day three came to be negative for both blood, urine, and cerebrospinal fluid. And metabolic screen was reported to be negative. So feeding with standard infant formula was resumed. On day four, symptoms recurred the child has vomiting and he became lethargic. So the question is, is this sepsis, which is not controlled, or this is something related to the feeding? So the next step is to keep MPO or to change antibiotics or switch, you know, feeding to amino acid-based formula or switch to an extensively hydrolyzed formula. So if you keep the patient MPO, you starve the patient, however, because patient is symptomatic, it may be, you know, wise to keep him MPO, and may you may change antibiotics, give him, you know, a, you know, a upgrade of his antibiotics, and uh, you, you could you use, you know, amino acid based formula or extensive hydrolyzed formula, uh, if you are thinking of cow milk allergy, but does cow milk allergy present with the lethargy and vomiting dehydration? This is the question. So uh, infectious disease surface was consulted and they uh, asked to change the antibiotics as usual. And patient developed diarrhea and he was kept in PO. So if he developed diarrhea now, is it because of antibiotics or it is because of the primary disease? So would you send the stool for Clostridium difficile toxin, viral studies and culture? Or would you repeat abdominal ultrasound or would you subject the patient to upper gastrointestinal endoscopy or do a sigmoidoscopy? So if you think of that, I think, you know, sending a stool for, you know, different studies is, 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 is acceptable. I don't think we need to repeat abdominal ultrasound at this stage or do upper GI endoscopy because at two months old, we need to put this patient under anesthesia to do the procedure. So sigmoidoscopy may be, you know, uh, you know one of the, possibilities to consider in this patient. So we did the colonoscopy and it has shown these findings, multiple ulceration with nodularity in the colon. So these are the ulcers and these are the nodules and the you know, pathology have shown xenophilic infiltration in the colonic biopsy. So what is the endoscopic histological diagnosis? Is it ulcerative colitis? So do membranous colitis, allergic colitis, or chronic granulomatous disease? I think the answer is, is clear. This is an allergic colitis because we are seeing isonophilic infiltrate in the colonic valves. And what is your clinical diagnosis of this isonophilic you know, colitis? Is it parasitic or fungal infections or drug reaction or food protein-induced enterocolitis or what is called f bias? So the answer is that this patient has f 
So he was started on extensively hydrolyzed formula. Formatting improved and patient is active. He had no more formatting and diarrhea on the, those day six and he was discharged. On follow-up, he was doing very well on uh, this uh, specially extensive hydrolyzed form. So uh, the diagnosis of food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome has been made in this child and he was appropriately uh, uh, you know, receiving you know, uh, extensively hydrolyzed formula. And uh, this is a clinical diagnosis. This case was seen like I have seen this patient like 15 years ago. And since then, we learned not to go more invasive, like doing, you know, endoscopy and biopsies, et cetera. We were depending on our, on our you know, clinical judgment to diagnose uh, such patients. The food-induced protein enterocolitis syndrome can present in two forms, either acute or chronic. The acute presentation, they have profuse repetitive vomiting and lethargy, often with dehyd de dehydration and diarrhea, and this is like our patient. And they have thrombocytosis, neutrophilia, and occasionally methemoglobinemia. Our patient has thrombocytosis, he has neutrophilia. And once the offending food is avoided, the clinical resolution occurs within two to three days. And this is what happened to our patient. When the patient was kept MPO, he improved. We didn't know that because he was kept in PO. We thought this is a response of you know, the antibiotics we, we, we used. However, most likely his response was because he was kept in PO. And the chronic form is you know, more difficult to diagnose. They have mild intermittent vomiting and diarrhea with some weight loss and failure to thrive. They may have anemia, hypoalbuminemia, and xenophilia and the clinical resolution may take longer time. So what is you know, uh, 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 the cause of food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome? Most of the time, it's commonly caused by cow's milk you know, allergy and soy protein allergy. However, other food like rice and oat may be disposed to this syndrome. Other solids food may also trigger FPIs. The prevalence of FPIs is unclear. More is unknown than known about the natural history of this disease. And misdiagnosis is common. You know, may, they may be, you know, uh, you know uh, diagnosed as, you know, reflux or diagnosed as, you know, some kind of, you know, infectious, you know, diarrhea and treated accordingly. However, Symptoms may mimic infection or surgical condition like our patient. So always infection or sepsis is top priority and surgical condition should be ruled out because it has you know, very you know, uh, bad consequences if it is not diagnosed early and treated early. And typically the IgE antibodies are negative in, in this syndrome. So the... Food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome is underdiagnosed in our practice. Delayed diagnosis for many months is the normal. And we need to increase awareness about you know, this disease. It is a benign condition with a favorable outcome. And the duration of the disease is relatively short left because the majority of these patients grow out of the condition by the age of three to five years. And using uh, undanesterone may be helpful in the management of acute presentation. So how would you diagnose, you know, these days, uh, you know, this syndrome? It is primarily based on clinical basis. However, incorrect diagnosis may lead to unnecessary and sometimes risky therapeutic intervention, like doing, you know, uh, you know, upper giant endoscopy, subjecting these infants to general anesthesia with all of its risk and cost also. So early recognition of FPIs and elimination of the positive food are crucial in preventing recurrence and facilitation of complete resolution. And I must you know, refer you to this very important position paper, which was you know, published by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology in 2017 about you know, the international consensus guidelines for the diagnosis and management of food protein-induced enterocolitis 
syndrome, which I found is very useful. So the official guidelines recommend the hypoallergenic formula for the treatment of f pies based on several studies demonstrating them that most children tolerated extensively hydrolyzed formula. Although there are selected children who exclusively tolerate amino acid-based formula. So the amino acid-based formula are the only completely non-allergenic formulas and can be effective in patients not responding to extensively hydrolyzed you know, formula and those with failure to fight. So it is very important to treat these patients with, you know, extensive hydrolyzed formula. And if they are not responding to shift them to amino acid base. And also this is, you know, a picture from uh, our family farm where you see the palm tree, uh, uh, you know, uh, all over the, the farm. Let's go to the second case. This is a three-month-old baby presented with pallor and generalized body swelling. He was a product of normal pregnancy, full-term vaginal delivery. He was also in standard infant formula and he was feeding very well. On physical examination, he was pale, not jaundiced. He has generalized edema. However, he had no skin rash and the rest of examination is normal. So this is a child who is pale and has no jaundice. He has generalized edema. Otherwise, he looks okay. So what is the next step that you will do? Would you do a urine dip stick, serum albumin, complete blood count with differential or album scan? I think, you know, doing a, a, a urine dip stick is a priority because, you know, an infant with generalized edema, that means this is an ophotic syndrome until proven otherwise. So you do a urine dip stick to look for proteinuria. And serum albumin is very important to see, you know, the uh, result of albumin uh, because most likely patient who had, you know, generalized edema, they have hypoalbuminemia. And the complete blood count because of the bellar, you look for hemoglobin and also the differential if you are dealing with, you know, any diseases may give you a clue about, you know, like lymphopenia or others. Albumin scan, we use it in pediatric gastroenterology to look for protein losing enteropathy. So albumin was, uh, serum albumin was 10 gram per liter, which is extremely low. Urine was negative for protein and hemoglobin is 7.5 with microcytic hypochromic picture. So this patient has no proteinuria, he has hypoalbuminemia, severe hypoalbuminemia. He has microcytic hypochromic anemia. And his white count is normal with mainly, uh, you know, neutrophil of 52% and lymphocyte of 36% and isonophil is 2%. So this is maybe a normal differential count. He underwent, you know, uh, an album scan, as you could see. And there is, it was reported as a bit. So what is the differential diagnosis of this child? Is he having heart failure, liver cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, or protein losing enteropathy? You know, if you go to heart failure, the patient has no symptoms of heart failure. He has no tachycardia, no tachypnea. And liver cirrhosis also, he has no hepatomegaly, and his liver tests are normal. Nephrotic syndrome is, is, is excluded by negative protein in the urine. And we are left with protein losing enteropathy supported by the severe hypoalbuminemia, negative protein in the urine, as well as you know, positive uh, albumin scan. So how would you manage this baby? Start iron therapy, start omeprazole, add protein to his formula, and start extensive hydrolyzed formula. So, if you think about these possibilities, yes, the patient needs iron therapy because of his low hemoglobin. However, omeprazole is not indicated in this patient, and adding a protein to his formula will not, you know, uh, you know, solve his problem uh, because he is losing protein through his gut, and the uh, hypoalbuminemia will continue. So the only, you know, possibility is that you may consider starting extensive hydrolyzed formula in this age group because this is a common cause of protein loss is cow milk allergy in an in, in infant of three months of age. So the patient was started on ferrous sulfate and he was started on extensively hydrolyzed formula. 
and the patient was, you know, discharged. And four weeks later, he was seen in the clinic. The edema have disappeared, and hemoglobin was reported to be 9.8, and albumin was 33 gram per liter. So this is a dramatic, you know, response to extensive hydrolyzed formula, uh, where his albumin has increased from 10 gram per liter to 33 gram, almost normal. Hemoglobin has improved also with iron supplements and the diagnosis of cow's milk protein allergy was made in this baby. Does, you know, patient with, you know, cow milk allergy present with protein losing enteropathy? Yes, it has been reported in the literature. You know, different causes of, you know, protein losing enteropathy. One of them is cow milk allergy. On the other hand, even, you know, you know, you know in, in severe atopic dermatitis, in an exclusively breastfed infant, there is a, a you know a case report of severe atopic dermatitis uh, presenting with protein losing neuropathy. Also, on the other hand, even egg allergy has been associated with protein losing neuropathy in a five-month-old boy. So you know there are you know case report of protein losing neuropathy secondary to allergic condition. COVID you know, related to cow's milk, you know, egg and, 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 and other possible allergies. So in conclusion, breastfeeding is the best and we need to make all efforts to promote breastfeeding in our, you know, community. And cow's milk allergy has different clinical presentation. These two presentations are not the usual where patient present with uh, uh, food protein induced enterocolitis uh, uh, as well as, you know, generalized edema. Uh, most of the pediatricians, they don't think of, uh, you know, cow milk allergy when they are dealing with, uh, you know, such uh, patients. And, uh, you know, we need to, you know, increase awareness about these presentations. It's not a classical presentation where patients may have, you know, some blood in stool, they may have some vomiting, they may have failure to thrive, et cetera, et cetera. However, I have, you know, uh, elected to present these two cases because I found them very, you know, informative and we need to increase awareness uh, in our pediatric community and, you know, healthcare provider dealing with, you know, infants uh, in their practice. And the key of success is, you know, high index of suspicion uh, in such cases. At the end, I would like to thank you very much. As I mentioned early, I missed, you know, uh, you know, being physically present in Cairo this year. Maybe, inshallah, in future meeting, we will meet. And uh, thank you very much for your listening. Really impressed by uh, a 9 a.